Thanks for the opportunity to come and speak. What I'm talking about here is quite futuristic, and what I mean by that is that it's not licensed. With there's work ongoing. We've got work that's due to be patent, uh, patents due to be published shortly, and when that comes out, we can talk more about it. Um, but it'll feed on nicely on some of the uh, topics that uh, Steve also mentioned along the way. So Venom Tech, we are a biotech based in Sandwich, so the old Pfizer site in Kent. And the reason for that is I spent 10 years there as a drug discovery biologist. What I was doing is looking for new uh, painkillers, new analgesics in humans. And one of the problems is a lot of painkillers like lidocaine is a fantastic painkiller, but you can't take it as a tablet because it will stop your heart. And that's because the targets that it's hitting in the skin are similar to the ones in the heart. And some of the venoms we were looking at could actually be more selective to the um, pain processing in the skin and not hit the similar target in the heart. Um, so uh, Pfizer and uh, many others decided that me and my colleagues needed something new to do. Um, in 2010, we all got made redundant. Um, and so I realized I had three core skills. I understood the safety, so I was a safety officer for the toxins we were working with. Uh, I understood the pharmacology of how drugs work uh, and how venoms could be drugs. And I also was keeping non-dangerous spiders and snakes as pets. And so I put three things together and formed Venom Tech to actually look at venoms for drugs. And then about six years ago, um, we also took a turn into biopesticides. Uh, and this was driven by customer demands. Um, uh, industry coming to us saying we need rodenticides that are not bioaccumulating, they're not generating tolerance, um, and also insecticides. And so what we're also doing now is looking at these venom proteins, so the small components within venoms, to uh, develop new rodenticides, which obviously we're going to talk about today. Um, and core of what we do is looking to nature. Uh, so we've solved the supply problem uh, of, of venoms for research by having the animals on site. So we have about 60 species of venomous snakes, cobras, rattlesnakes, vipers, through to big uh, tarantulas, small spiders, uh, scorpions. We also look at some British spiders as well. So, um, and um, sort of putting that together to actually look at the compounds within venoms. Um, and so what the core of what we're doing is looking to nature for, for inspiration for what we're doing and how we're tackling the target, whether it's a drug target or a, a pesticide target. Obviously the top two uh, kill rodents, but very mechanical means. And it's really interesting uh, with Steve Sorks and part of my question there about how predators kill prey. Um, I, I also lecture in falconry and with the <coughs> sort of big eagles, it's often talon penetration. But with owls, the mechanism of death in rodents is thoracic pressure. Um, the talons are not actually penetrating the rodent most of the time, they're just squeezing. Uh, and when you get a dramatic increase in thoracic pressure, it then leads to um, random rupturing of blood vessels. And that, that's the mechanism of death, so quite crude. Um, we also look at um, parasites and ways of, you know, can we learn from natural parasites? But the core of what we do is, is venom. So how venoms kill their prey is principally by injection. That's part of the definition of being a venom. It's injected rather than something that you eat, uh, which is more likely a poison. But they're really complex mixtures. They do lots of different things. And that's the, the challenge of what we have, is working out how we take these things apart. Now, snakes have a huge diet. Uh, it also includes other snakes. So uh, things like king cobras and king snakes are quite famous for eating other snakes. Um, there's several uh, fish-eating snakes. So obviously, venoms are acting on fish, which could be a, a, an aquatic toxicology problem. Um, but also domestic pets. Uh, there's a lot of uh, dogs and cats involved in um, snake bites and, and the venom kills them, it is toxic, uh, as well as to, to amphibians. So there's a whole range of different things that venom is doing, let alone obviously being a major problem in um, third world countries and a lot of farmers actually being bitten by venomous snakes and then they lose a digit or um, worse and then they can't, can't work. So snake bite is a major problem. And interestingly enough, one of the big problems of snake bite is food, and that food are the rodents that are being the pests on the farms. So um, I think there's also a, a good synergy here with actually 
controlling rodent populations in these tropical countries will help control snake populations. And then that has a direct impact on the human health as well as, uh, I was really interested to see about the uh, rodent bite problems uh, in humans as well. So venom-based pesticides are, are definitely possible, they're not new. Uh, Vesteron have got a, a spear T, it's licensed in the US, licensing in, the U in Europe is coming shortly. And this is based on a spider venom um, peptide. Uh, we've done some other work ourselves, looking at uh, bean weevils. And so the interesting thing here is that the venom is contact toxic to these insects. So it's actually acting as a pesticide. Now, we don't understand why, because in evolution, venom has evolved to be injected in its prey, but it's clearly having other activities. And this is allowing us to broaden out how we use venoms in a drug discovery process and what other things we can do with it, but it is still a very complex mixtures. So where do we start? Which venoms do we pick? Well, there's a whole range of species that we're working with. Um, there's some that are directly rodent toxic, so the two snake species, for instance, um, but also a lot of others that are more mechanistically interesting that don't um, turn up normally because even though some of those spiders um, up in D, one of the Indian ornamentals, they get as big as my hand, they're still not eating rodents. But when you look at their venom composition, there are neurotoxic opportunities there to use a venom to tune it to a rodenticide. So how we select the correct venom is working from our large species of um, venomous animals and um, looking at the mechanism, so how these compounds are actually working and um, taking them apart. So it's a bit like crude oil. There's several hundred different components in each venom and we can then separate them out and understand which ones are doing the job. So a little bit of biochemistry here. So here's some examples of um, venoms that are out there. So these spider toxins, what we would call them as small molecules. Uh, and they are, um, sorry, yeah, analogous, I'll be careful to kick in that, of um, yeah, bromodialone is also a small molecule toxin. Uh, and it's nice, they're, they're compounds that get into the gut and they're not digested because they're not proteins. So um, all mammals eat proteins of some sort. And so our guts have evolved to digest those proteins. And that's the big challenge. So when we look at small peptides, so Bieta is a, a type two diabetes drug from a lizard uh, venom. And this is a, has to be injected because the gut recognizes that protein as being a, a protein and digests it. So a core thing of what we're doing is actually understanding how we can stop them being digested. Um, but when getting through that, there's a range of different ways in which snake kills their prey. Uh, neurotoxic is quite uh, common in the cobras and mambas. And then uh, vipers often are killed more by cytotoxins or, or coagulation effects. And one of the interesting things that we've got here is that even within the snakes, there's a whole range of different proteins that are used in different things. And different snakes have different combinations of these. So cobras have more of these neurotoxins, and these are wonderfully stable. You can heat them to 100 degrees centigrade, and they still are neurotoxic, which means that they are stable enough to put into a, a wax block when a wax is liquid. Um, and then other things like the viper venoms have more enzymes that are involved in um, blood coagulation pathways and um, those sort of things, but they're less, less stable, so we can sort of tune what's going on between them. So our process, we use a molecular sieve called a HBLC to separate the venom out into its component parts. So if we do one pass, each peak is a collection of different venom proteins. We can take that peak and run it again and we'll get the uh, higher resolution. So we'll end up with a whole series of these and we'll put them into a 96 well plate. So this is basically 96 test tubes together in an assay. Uh, and then uh, four times that would be the 384 well plates that you see here. Um, and the blue wells show where the venom has killed the cells. Uh, and the pink are showing live cells that have changed the dye from blue to pink. And this allows us to find out which fractions are interested in a particular pathway. So we might be using uh, liver cells, heart cells, brain cells, whichever mechanism we want to be targeting, and find the individual component of the venom that might be uh, of interest. 
And then we take that forward uh, using what we know about drug discovery. Core things we understand is we can actually do a, a gut model in the lab. So this is two bits of plastic with a cell line in between. And this cell line is the same as what lines your gut. And we can then put the venom on the top and see if it comes through the bottom. And that will tell us if it can actually be orally absorbed and therefore make it a quite a good candidate for being a rodenticide. We then look at the stability against gut proteases and we look at the changes between a uh, venom that hasn't been digested and those that have and see the patterns and areas where there's opportunities for get a venom actually uh, orally toxic. So we all also have done this with whole venom and we know that it's about between 50 and 300 milligrams per kilogram orally toxic of a venom and people don't realize that that's not out there that venoms are, are toxic orally, but that dose is huge. So we're trying to refine that and bring that down through biomanufacturing processes. And then it's looking about the, the ecotoxicology side of things. Because uh, proteins are abundant in nature, they're great food resources for bacteria, so they're readily broken down. We're doing some work at the moment uh, looking at uh, are the venom peptides toxic to plants um, and uh, other so environmental animals um, that we do for environmental toxicity. But interestingly, for there's a low risk of bioaccumulation because, um, and I picked this out, the Mexican flag, is because the center is an eagle eating a snake. There's a lot of raptors that eat venomous snakes and it doesn't harm them at all. So there's a good opportunity for us if we can get a rodenticide based on a venom that can kill the rodents and the raptors are already um, immune to it or they digest it or ideally it doesn't actually uh, it's not stable in that second generation we can stop that uh, the bioaccumulation problems and hopefully there's a low chance of resistance because snakes have been eating rodents for millions of years and if resistance would have occurred but it would have turned up already um, the snakes don't necessarily give the rats chance to get away <laughs> and become immune to it um, but it's still work we're, we're looking for and it's uh, a good opportunity with what we're doing. So uh, just sort of bringing it all together, we've got these complex mixtures. Uh, they've evolved to be injected, but we can engineer them to be ingested. And we've got millions of potential opportunities. One of the great things with venom is it's so powerful evolutionary. It's evolved over a hundred independent times. So there isn't a common ancestor between snakes and scorpions of the venoms because the venom operators at either ends of the snake. Um, in catfish, it's evolved 30 different times independently. So there's a huge diversity of compounds we can pick from. And then actually using these that shouldn't be persistent in the environment. Um, and there's a range of different mechanisms. So even though there's a lot of coagulopathic venoms, they're different than the anticoagulants that are currently used as rodenticides. So there's still opportunities there. Um, and for us, uh, I'd hope to have the patent published, we could talk about it, but it's getting there. Uh, <laughs> we'll definitely be shouting about it on our website and social media feed when it actually is published. And I can actually, when the data is published, we'll actually be able to show the evidence around a new peptide based uh, rodenticide that we've got coming along. And uh, we've got a second one much earlier in its discovery phase. And we're doing more along the way. So um, with that rapid tour of biochemistry, I can happily take any questions, and it's just better a summary of the, the things that VenomTech are providing. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. yeah, just uh, also tying in with the, the earlier talk, I mean, um, is, are you looking at, you're inevitably going to get the animal welfare objections to some, some of the mechanisms yeah. that kill? Um, are you, are you looking into that, how you, how you get around Yeah, that? so it's, yeah. Um, it's definitely something that was uh, discussed early on in the project. And one of the things about picking the right mechanism is that what we sort of see as humane, with you look at neurotoxicity, what you see appears to be humane. So an animal sort of slowing down, you see ptosis, so the eyelids close first. Um, and then um, your paralysis sets in. But as a biologist, what's actually happening is you're just paralyzing the muscles that control breathing. You're not stopping anything else. The animal dies of asphyxiation. But because the muscles are paralyzed, they're not convulsing if they were asphyxiating 
normally. So it might be apparently humane, even though the underlying mechanism might be, might be different. So it is something we're looking at. But one of the things that stood out to me coming from a um, pharmaceutical um, background is that the, the media challenge back in the sort of 90s with the huge animal rights movement the pharmaceutical industry were like, well, we're not talking to anybody. We're being quiet and sitting away. And so the only, the only story that was getting out was the, the anti-story. And it took until probably mid-2000 before things like... Um, they used to be called the um, Anti-Vivisection Defence League, and I can't think of what they're called now, Understanding Animal Welfare, um, UAR, actually then put a brave face on and actually presented the other side of why we're doing this. And I think probably in this redensite world, it probably needs that, start pushing that balance. But yeah, it's a good question. Sorry, I meandered a bit there. <laughs> yeah. So with the venom-based uh, redensite, would it be long-term to work to make a synthetic venom, or is it that it's farmed from animals? Because how would that work with the animal welfare yeah. aspect of it? We make it synthetic very, very early. Um, because you'd need farms <laughs> of snakes. So as soon as we um, get to the stage of understanding the protein sequence, um, again, we're borrowing from a pharmaceutical R&D that we can just send that off in an email and that protein will arrive in the post. So we can, yeah, we make it synthetic very early. So we've got like two snakes of each species most of the time. So. Um, are rodents more susceptible than others, or humans or other not target species? To some of the toxins, definitely. Um, and as, as I said, there's a, a big mixture of toxins within the venoms. Some are very rodent specific, some are insect specific, for instance. Um, but there are plenty that do that are toxic to humans um, as well. So it's, it's picking the, the right component. But yes, there are rodent selected toxins, toxins in there. I suppose one of the concerns is, I mean, getting regulatory approvals, there's probably no, no antidote to these. So if uh, there was an accident of poison incident, then it could be. So interestingly, from the snake bite world, there is anti-venom. And if the peptide is not too different from the original venom, then the anti-venom will probably work. But what we're actually working on is in the lab, when we're doing the screens against rodent cells, we're also looking at human cells, bird cells, and canine cells to actually make the compound selective at the mechanism level. Um, and then we can use the anti-venom as, as a last resort at the end afterwards. I, mean, I, th I think um, obviously these are acute poisons, aren't they? So once once they're deployed, um, there's obviously the issue surrounding acceptance of acute poison because they've got rapid onset of symptoms. Potentially, yes. Yeah. So um, with the what's coming out in the patents, we've looked at a a very um, slow mechanism to uh, because if we deploy a neurotoxin in what we know at the moment, you. You know, the sort of black mambas will kill humans in 10 minutes. So you'll, you could end up with a pile of rats at the bait station. So we have looked at a, a slow, accumulative toxin in the pan that's coming out. But enough to allow a, a, a rat to consume a lethal dose? Yeah. From, from one day to <coughs> Yeah. But it's still, yeah, still work ongoing, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. so um, HSC, have you made contact with them yet? Uh, uh, yes, before I set up that okay. So <laughs> how... How have conversations been with them for registration purposes? Uh, so, um, with that side of things, we don't expect it to be any different to the, the um, compounds that are out there, really, because it's all about having that data pack of how it is toxic to uh, other animals and humans and so. Um, it's, the challenge for us is not the safety side of things, it's the fact that it's a completely different chemical class. And that's where the challenge is going to be in registration, more so than, than safety. You know, the, the HSE side of things, it's going to rely on the, the data pack. Um, because they're notoriously nervous about new products and new compounds. And yeah, yeah. So they're going to need shit like of information. Yeah, and that's why we're sort of you know, getting the patent out there, having that body of data um, before we own, sort of go to registration. But uh, we're doing the first in vivo trials are sort of on the way and end of this year. So. We'll start to know a bit more then, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's getting that data pack. We know it's a hurdle, but it's, um, we need to try. We need something different. We need, we need new chemical mechanisms, new chemical classes. So uh, it's not, we're not doing it because it's e easy. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, are these uh, these new compounds? Um, are, are they also going to address uh, pain relief in the action as well? They can do, because when a lot of you know that's where my background started is looking yeah. at analgesic yeah. peptides. So, yeah, that's going to be a big thing in, in the public public's mind. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right at the back. Yeah, how long does it take to kill the rat from the time it leaves the paste? Uh, so it. Um, so we're just about to start our uh, rodent study, so we don't actually know yet. But what we've looked at is a range of different things. So some of the uh, neurotoxin, it, it can be minutes, to the onset of paralysis, um, versus um, what we're looking at is sort of more uh, systemic effects that the actual catastrophic event is as short as possible, but late. So it's, we don't, you know, in, in short, we don't know yet. We're looking into it. Is there any chance of resistance during this? this so, yeah, what I sort of put there about um, venomous snakes eating eating rodents, that, um, that's only part of the story. So there is, a, there is a chance, and we don't know what that is yet, but the interesting of how these molecules interact with their target, because they're a chain of amino acids, we can uh, tweak them to catch up with that resistance. So there's, it's a... Um, an opportunity for a compound class rather than just one one compound, um, but at the moment we don't know because the you know there are animals that have evolved resistance to snake venoms, but things like um, meerkats and mongoose, for instance, quite famously so, uh, and the snakes themselves are immune to their own venoms. So um, until we start looking at the pathology in the whole rat, which is stuff that's going on uh, in the next few months we'll start to fully understand what that risk is, but it should be lower because if rodents were going to come immune to, to snake venoms, we would, have, we would see that in countries where they're living side by side.